Good morning, everybody. It's a really special day here at Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. I'm Lisa Salberg, your host and the founder and CEO of the organization. And it's a special day for me. It is my seventh heart transplant anniversary day. So it is my heart anniversary, and it is heart month and I'm wearing red for women and I got my heart earrings on. We are blinging it out for HCM Awareness Day later this month and we are all in for heart awareness today. Before I get too far into podcasting today, I have to take a moment as we start to recognize Brandy, who was my donor, and to recognize Brandy's family, who made the ultimate decision to allow her to be my heart hero and to save my life. It's been seven years. I am really lucky how blessed I have been in my transplant journey. I know not everybody has it go so smoothly, but it has been a relatively good seven years health-wise. COVID was a little stress-inducing for a transplant patient, but we got through it and we're here today. And I just want to share some gratitude from my heart to all of the families who have made the decision to be organ donors and let their family members be organ donors. I come from a family that donated my sister's organs. And then 24 years later, I was on the other side of that. So yes, it's Go Red for Women Day. Yes, it's Heart Month. And yes, it's my transplant anniversary, but I'm going to encourage you to make sure that you signed up to be an organ donor because you could be somebody's hero when life is not possible any longer. Shout out to all my transplant friends on this special day and to celebrate February 2nd and Heart Month this week, two HCM warriors got transplants. Both are doing well today. One of them woke up today and her first words were very classic her. They were four letter words, so we'll just leave them there. But she I think the first F word was for, ow, I'm in pain. The second one is, A, I'm alive. And the third one was, I made it through. So that's how I interpret her three F words as she woke up. (laughs) So uh, I am joined today by two fabulous women, one I've known a long time and one I'm just getting to know. So we have the team from Nashville present and St. Thomas's HCM Center of Excellence, Anna Radonsky and Jamie so ladies welcome to tales from the heart on this special day yes thank you so much for having us we have a special sign for you oh no (laughs) thank you so much that's adorable (laughs) yes happy anniversary i was gonna sing but you know we did the flintstone song happy anniversary (laughs) happy anniversary anniversary. but it's hard to So happy anniversary to you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's heart month. And I wanted to talk to some new people on Tales from the Heart, different perspectives of HCM care. Annie, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you came to be in the HCM program? And then we'll hear from Jamie. I started my HCM career as an x-ray tech and I worked in the cath lab for 10 years as an x-ray tech, collecting the hemodynamics of patients with HCM. I was very interested in doing all of the measurements, the right heart caths and all of that. So I was very interested in that. And that was like my first experience with HCM. After I was an x-ray tech in the cath lab for 10 years, I finally went to PA school. And now I've been a cardiology PA for 21 years. I have done multiple avenues of cardiology, interventional cardiology, scrubbing on procedures, doing stress tests, working in the office and outpatient. And then after interventional cardiology, I went to Yale and I worked with the advanced heart failure and transplant team and the cardiomyopathy program there. And that was where I met my first mentor, Dr. Dan Jacoby, who was amazing, is amazing, and still a really good friend of mine. I talk to him all the time. And that's where I really like dove into HCM, and he taught me so much, and we ran an amazing program there. We became a center of excellence at Yale, which is a great program. I'm so grateful for all of the people that I met there and all the education and experience that I got from being at Yale, that has enabled me to bring that research experience to Ascension St. Thomas West, where I joined about five years ago with Dr. Zenker. So and the way that that all kind of came about is I was looking to relocate to Nashville and I looked into Nashville. I found Dr. Zenker. I sent him an email. I said, hey, I'm a PA in HCM. Would love to see how you run your program. I came here for a visit. I went to clinic with him and I loved his bedside manner. I loved how kind he was, how he treated patients like they were so important. And at that moment, 
he could give them every answer that they have been struggling to get from other providers along the way. A year after that, he was still building his program. A year after that, I saw him at the conference at the HCM Summit in Boston. And I went up and we talked for about 10 minutes. He said he was still building his program. And then a year after that, he says, hey, I built my program. Are you ready to come? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So that's how I kind of came to Nashville. So I think that's a good point to make because my trajectory through this whole process is really amazing. And I don't think I would know and understand as much as I do now if I didn't start off as an x-ray tech chemodynamic wise and knowing the real basis of this whole disease process. I am super grateful and super fortunate for having been at Yale as Center of Excellence and then moving to St. Thomas West and becoming Center of Excellence here. I have the privilege of working with so many wonderful physicians and surgeons at Yale and both here at St. Thomas. So it's been a really amazing experience. And speaking of transplant, as it is your anniversary, the first time I met Lisa was when I was at Yale and we were trying to become a center of excellence, actually. So we did succeed, but that was the first time I met Lisa. And that was also when you were getting kind of sick and heading towards your transplant. That was like way back when I was at Yale, like seven years ago. Actually, the site visit, this is how crazy Lisa is. Yeah, so, that's right. So the site visit actually occurred after my transplant. I was, I should not have been working. Yeah. It was like, nine weeks after my transplant, I was doing the site visit. Yes, I do remember that because we had to keep it very minimal people in the room and we were really careful, but it was really, it was a lot. Yeah, that's right. I had the pregnazone face going on. <laughs> you guys had a list of pregnazone face Lisa and like hyper Lisa. It was in <laughs> retrospect, I probably should have put that off another month or two, but we had the relationship before we finished it and you were the first program post transplant. It was, it was oh, you and Westchester. Yeah. I kind of did you guys back to back. I kind of had to wait until I could actually move without my millerinone pump. Oh my so God, it's, it's been a long road, baby. Yeah. I can remember meeting Dr. Zanker for the first time. And I met him in the most unusual way. He was at Mark Sherrod's NYU conference. And he was sitting a row behind me. And this guy kept getting up to the microphone and asking really good questions. Not just like, can you really explain obstruction to me? Like yeah. deep, if you have the catheter in this particular position and the gradient is X and you move it to here and it's Y, what is the mechanism of this? And I'm like, okay, I love how he's dissecting and really getting in. So I tapped him and I said, um, we need to meet. He's like, okay, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I think I need you to see more HCM patients. He's like, I'm not ready yet. And he came along a little bit slowly. He wanted to learn and build his knowledge. And I started working with him. And he's like, so I got this opportunity to hire this PA from Yale. What do you think? I'm like, you're a fool to let her go. Grab her. And here we are today. So crazy, isn't it? It so is. It's really, it, it like speaks for the whole HCM community that we're all so collaborative and we can only learn from what each other has experienced, you know? So it, it, it's really just amazing to be part of the whole HCM community and the growth and everything that's, that's going on in the, in the field. It's really amazing. It has been a crazy couple of years of growth and we're still growing and mm -hmm. we're going to need a bigger boat, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So you have a new colleague with you, a relatively new colleague. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Jamie Belden. I'm an RN and um, I've been here at Ascension St. Thomas West for just a little over a year now. I moved here, relocated from California, was just about ready to not make the trip because I just wasn't finding the right fitting job here. And all of a sudden I got messaged from a recruiter here at Ascension for actually a different position. And as we spoke and I met with people here, we were like, well, you might be a better fit for this. And then I was like, HCM, yes. Like I, I started my career in cardiology. I used to work with patients prior to transplant. So it was really a perfect fit for me. I've learned so much since working with Annie and Dr. Zinker and can't even imagine not being here with them. It's It's been a really wonderful experience. It's heart month, right? Like we're we're right on topic. We're like very trendy right now. But I want to talk a little bit about something I speak of often, but I want our listeners to get a different perspective. 
about 20 some odd years ago, we started to develop the HCMA recognized center of excellence model as there was no structured model for HCM care. And so we made it up and we took from best practices from a lot of different modalities and we created a basic infrastructure that is an HCM center of excellence, which is a multidisciplinary approach, multidisciplinary, just fancy words for lots of different perspectives on cardiology. So imaging professionals, non-invasive cardiologists, invasive cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, electrophysiologists, yeah. geneticists. We have this whole group of clinical professionals from the physician side, and then this supportive side of PAs, which, Amy, I want you to talk a little bit more about the role of a PA because it's not common in all of our program. And then you have the practitioners, and then you have RNs, and then you have schedulers and medical assistants, and you have this entire infrastructure to take care of individual patients who may actually use the resources of all of those specialists. But how does the center of excellence model work? What are the players and why is it important? First, I'll just talk about the way that we run our clinic and the way that we have all of these other providers that we mm -hmm. also tap into. We run our clinics, Dr. Zanker, Jamie, and I go into every clinic, every patient's room together, and we speak about the patients. We review all of their images and everything before we go into the room, and then we have our game plan. We all discuss it. You know, we say, what else do we need? We kind of get our plan together, go in the room, and then address all of the things. And it, it's a team effort because we'll, we'll all go in the room and Dr. Zanker will interview the patient and we'll be taking notes. And then when Dr. Zanker finishes, maybe Jamie and I will stay in the room for a little bit longer with the patient and talk to them about some more questions or concerns. And then sometimes I'll leave the room and Jamie will stay in, even in longer. And it's just, it's really, it's to make that connection with the patient to let them know that we are a team and it takes a team to take care of you the proper way and to make sure that you're getting all of the tests that you need to get so that we're keeping you safe in the HCM community. It's really wonderful the way that we run our clinic. Um, actually, Dr. Zanker just came in. I just heard the door. We have, a, we have a guest appearance. <laughs> <laughs> this was unscripted and oh, there's a hand. God. Come on, Dr. Zanker. <laughs> Hey, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Yeah, no. So Dr. Zanker is doing TEs today. So I want to hey. say one thing about Dr. Zanker, fine man here. One thing about our program that I think is so amazing is that Dr. Zanker reads everything and does everything for our HCM patients. So echoes, nukes, pets, amyloid scans, make sure that our HCM patients don't have amyloid, MRIs, he does all the right and left heart cats, he gets his own hemodynamics, he's like the full the full package. So Lisa, you can appreciate that. Yeah, I think like, like Annie says, being really hands on with these people because, you know, that's really what, what they need to help them, you know, lead down this journey. And now we got so many options with Mavicampton, more research in Afficampton. We've got a patient recovering from surgical myectomy who's in the hospital now doing great. So we're really continue to be excited about offering these options to our patients. Well, that's fantastic. You walked into the conversation as we were explaining why HCMA recognized center of excellence models are the appropriate model for patients with HCM and, and what makes your program a little bit, you know, every program's a little different. They're not all mm -hmm. better, they're unique. And let, let's talk to the audience a little bit about how do you bring in your, your colleagues from surgery or EP to consult, and I, yeah. I know one of my most important aspects of explaining how to build your team for a center is build it with people you can fight with and still respect, <laughs> because you're gonna get a little, I think it should go this way, I think it should go that way. How do you guys work it all out? You're right, in part, what I did is we picked people to be part of our group that number one, were well-trained, and number two, had a real interest in HCM. So specifically, the structural heart cardiologist, whose name is Dr. Andrew Morse, has specific training when he came here in alcohol septal ablation. And we were fortunate to have two cardiothoracic surgeons that had contemporary training in doing surgical myectomy with good outcomes. And then what we do is, you know, with the cases that we think are, uh, we need to discuss, we have a forum every Thursday for a collaborative conference where we meet with cardiothoracic surgery, interventional cardiology, imaging, cardiac anesthesia, 
where we discuss complicated cases that could include an HCM case. So if we have a case where we think there's some nuances that need to be discussed amongst the group of individuals, then that's the form that we use. So if I have a case that we think is challenging that needs further discussion, then we meet at 6 a.m. actually every Thursday as part of this group to discuss cases like that. That's commitment, 6 a.m. Yeah, commitment. early. Yeah, 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 yeah. you got to get at it early. That's how we handle that. And I think it's really works well because all those groups are represented. And as you know, boy, the imaging is important, cardiac anesthesia, cardiothoracic surgery, interventional cardiology. We always want to offer, you know, the latest techniques and options. And sometimes there are patients for which, you know, maybe a candidate for SRT, maybe a, a good candidate for medical therapy. Even with Mavicampton being available, a lot of our younger patients still want a a surgical myectomy, and, and we want to offer that if they're low risk and reasonable to do that. But that's kind of a good forum to discuss some of these cases where there is any sort of equipoise about what to do. I think the great part of Center of Excellence Care is the discussion of the options. It's not yeah. do this. It's here are some things we can consider. What are your preferences as a patient? What does your anatomy allow us to consider? And what does your anatomy allow us not to consider? and help them make that decision with the team and having a PA and an RN and a physician all working together to help mm -hmm. explain to the patient the concept of shared decision-making yeah. is great, but when it gets down to it, it's really hard to do it well because to share in the decision, the patient needs to have enough information to make a good choice. And we know that that's laborious. It takes yeah. time. We try to help set them up to ask you the right questions, to get to an answer that meets their needs as quickly as possible. But boy, these can be complicated and emotional conversations. It's Heart Month. If there's a message that you think the world should know about HCM, and we're talking diagnosed or undiagnosed, what's the most important message you think people should know about HCM during Heart Month? I think it's continuing to identify patients with the disease. I still think we are under identifying patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So as cardiologists, I challenge all of us to make sure to identify patients with HCM. And I think we are doing better in that regard. And as patients that are struggling with symptoms and sometimes may not get the appropriate advice to look for a center of excellence in their area and to get another opinion if they feel like they're not doing well. And what I think is really exciting about today's HCM workflow is that we do have all these options. Since the 1960s, we've had beta blockers of nothing else available. And now, of course, we have SRT, as we did before, but now we have Mavicampton, we have clinical trials looking at Afficampton, we have um, trials going on for both the non-obstructive and obstructive patients. So I think I, I continue to challenge us as doctors and cardiologists to identify these patients and continue to ask patients to inquire if they aren't, if they're seeing a doctor and they don't feel like they're being identified with a disease or given options, they should look for another opinion. They should look for a center of excellence in their area because just like you said, we'll generally set aside an hour's time for that first clinic visit because I want to review all their data. I want to review their symptoms, their family history, impart to them that you have these choices. And like you say, sometimes we'll say, well, this probably is your best choice, but here are the options. And sometimes there are choices that they need to help us make. And it's interesting because a lot of patients are paternalistic and say, well, what would you do? And a lot of patients want to know all the options, and we want to give them all the options and every opportunity to ask questions. But there are times where, you know, we know which option may be the best, but there are some times where there's indecision. And, and we definitely want to incorporate patients and families in this journey and work together. Annie, what's the one thing you want patients in the general community to know about HCM during Heart Month? I think us as providers, it's our responsibility to share our knowledge with other providers. So one of the things that I do is I teach at Lipscomb University. 
So we have students that come from the PA program that do their cardiology elective with our team. So they get a lot of education. I mean, it's like all HCM. And actually, my last student said that there was one HCM and one amyloid question on the PA boards this year. So at least we got one. <laughs> I'll take it. I said you better have gotten it right, right? <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, so it's really amazing. So and then I give a two hour cardiomyopathy lecture to Lipscomb University every year. And it's really about the biggest thing that I tell the students is that a lot of patients that have HCM get misdiagnosed with anxiety or asthma. And I tell them when you're just starting and you hear a 20 year old with these symptoms, don't just think she has anxiety. The most important thing is to get an EKG and get an echo. So that's what I tell people, because I think if we get more echoes than we are getting on younger people, we can diagnose the disease much earlier. Because, you know, a young female with chest pain in the ER gets poo-pooed as anxiety because they're tachycardic, but there could be a reason why that's going on because they have underlying HCM, you know? So that's my big thing when I talk to my students is get an EKG and get an echo. It's covered by insurance. It's the easiest thing in the world and it gives you so much information. Don't diagnose somebody with anxiety or asthma until you get an echo. I love that. Jamie. People need to listen to their bodies a little bit more than they do. And I can't even tell you how many times people have just casually ask me questions about what do you think this is that's going on? And I make recommendations, you know, you need to see your doctor or whatever. And then they just say, I'll do it later. They don't listen to it. I've seen too many tragedies happen when people just don't listen to what their body's telling them. If you know something's wrong, it's not going to take much time to at least go be examined and get it checked out, make sure that it's not HCM. Maybe, maybe it is anxiety, but you need to go find out. And to take that chance that it's going to go the wrong way is not worth it to you, to your loved ones, anyone. Those are all great messages. As we at the HCMA get ready for a very chaotic month ahead, we've got a couple of legislative initiatives that we're moving forward. And if you told me 20 years ago that the answers to finding people with HCM were going to live mostly in the legislative realm, I don't think I would have believed you, but I think that's where we need to be. So we are moving forward with our Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act to ensure that all children ages 1 to 19 have the opportunity for their parents to discuss with their pediatrician their family heart health history and what has happened within that family. And if that child is exhibiting any symptoms that the family may have written off as normal. And I have, I have an update and we're going to be sharing a story later this month. There is a family here in New Jersey that had the child go for an exam, pre-participation sports physical. So in New Jersey, we cleaned up our PPE exam and we added the well child. So every child gets the same screening. This family goes in, their regular doctor is not available. A new doctor who has just taken the course hears a murmur and says, I hear a murmur. And they're like, oh, the doctor never mentioned it before. She's like, you want to check this out. So referral to cardiology, appropriate, appropriate testing, diagnosed with HCM, Pretty significant HCM, needing an ICD, getting it later this month, but we opened up the family and we went upstream and dad is also now diagnosed with HCM. So instead of an interaction with a healthcare provider diagnosing a person, we've now opened up the family and we're able to keep that family safe and hopefully keep them whole for many, many years to come. This is the power of legislation. We made a law that the doctors have to learn this and the doctors needed to learn it so that they could practice it because maybe they didn't get it in med school or PA school or NP school because maybe it was 20 years ago and we weren't talking about it. So now they have the opportunity to refresh their knowledge, know these diseases and understand them better. And it's happened here in New Jersey. And that's, you know, I dreamed that this would be the way that it happened and it's proven out. And that's one family. There are others, but this one's willing to go public. So we're going to be sharing their story later in the month. We're going to Capitol Hill on February 15th, and we're asking Congress to make some changes to the Welcome to Medicare exam. Let's ask those same family heart health history questions in the Welcome to Medicare exam and get those families identified from the top down. Grandma and grandpa can get diagnosed and the kids can get their screening. This way we catch the parents in the middle. And we find families who have genetic heart disease, not just HCM, but what if they're 65 and they have amyloid and they didn't know it? Or what if they're 65 and they have uncontrolled hypertension that needs management? 
we can keep healthcare costs down and people healthier by early diagnosis. And asking the right questions is key. What do you guys think? Absolutely. Well, yeah, one thing I always <laughs> tell the cardiology fellows, I mean, an easy way to do a genetic screening is a good family history. If you've got a family history and somebody's had sudden cardiac death, somebody's had significant early congestive heart failure. We do the same thing in the aortopathy clinic. We're always screening for you know sudden death from aortic dissection. And it's just taking a little more time to do a thorough family history is really a platform sometimes to, like you say, identifying family members and really making a big impact on not just one patient, but the patient's family too. I think as we go down a new path at the HCMA and that's more Legislative advocacy, I mean, obviously, we're going to keep doing the things that we do, navigation calls, intake, center of excellence development, all of those wonderful projects like this one are going to continue. But we're going to need more foot soldiers to get to their state houses and explain to state lawmakers why it's important. We're going to the Hill on the 15th. It's my first personal HCMA briefing. If you told me 20 years ago, I would be going to Capitol Hill and holding our own briefing. I'd be like, oh, that's just a dream. Has anybody ever done a Hill day? No. Okay. So first you have to go to all the offices and invite the, the members and their staff to come to your briefing. They'll get an email, but it's better if you make a personal appearance in their office and hand them a paper and say, please come join us. We're doing this on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, heart month, heart cause. You know, sweetheart cutie pies with a little language, like, I love you, kiss me, and be mine. There's a little invitation sticker on the back of it that says, come to our briefing. And we're gonna be dropping these off at the Capitol in all of the members' offices and inviting them to come have lunch and learn about HCM. And I have an announcement to make about our Hill Day. We will be joined by HCM patient and NBA player for the Wizards, Jared Butler. He will be coming to the Hill with us to share his story of diagnosis and management and why he thinks it's important to raise awareness of HCM. We will also be joined by Marty Marin and Steve Amon, Dietra DeBose, as well as our friend Ryan from Patch and a couple of amazing families one is the family of Amy, uh, Jillian Blair, Amy Blair, her mother. Jillian passed away from a delayed diagnosis. So we're going to share her story. We are also going to share the story of Marsha. She's 81 years old. She's fabulous. She's living with HCM in a current QVC model. And she's going to come share her story of being a senior living with HCM. So we're going to cover the spectrum, living and thriving, lost and, and older. We want people to know about us on the Hill and we want to make sure our community remains able to get access to these new therapies that are coming. So we talked a little bit about genetics. I know this is early days, very, very early days, but we did gene therapy in somebody with HCM a few months ago. Oh, I think that's phenomenal. And, and I can definitely see how that could be a real game changer. I mean, if we had a therapy for which we had, we could actually change the phenotype of the disease as a one-time therapy, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about that prospect. In fact, we're looking at a couple of different trials here at my center, looking at gene therapy, because I'm, I'm really excited about that as an option. As somebody with an identified gene and a long family history, I too am excited about that. It's almost a dream that it's almost possible. I mean, it, it, it's possible. We've, we've done it once, but we need to see the results. There's a few other patients that I know are in pipeline to be dosed next. The timing is unknown at this point, but we all need to stay aware in touch with this science as it develops. It's going to be a long path. There's a lot of questions. The who, the when, the what, we don't know yet. So stay tuned. We'll bring you more. Pivoting for a moment, we've evolved as a community. We're growing as a community. What do you guys see the biggest challenges are for our future in HCM? Is it the getting them diagnosed or is it getting them into a treatment model or is it a combination of both? I think there's a lot of things. Early treatment and early identification is the biggest thing, right? So we can only do that by educating our colleagues about what to look at an echo. And echoes, there's a million echoes done in our hospital every day, right? And if you just take the time to educate your colleagues on what to look for on an echo, that means that could be suggestive HCM. That's the way you kind of help your team out in spreading this whole process. To help people just to learn how to look at an echo report and identify the abnormalities, and it can lead to 
the rest of the whole diagnosis. I think the other thing, you know, with these new drugs coming out, with Camzios being available, and hopefully others in the near future, is to help with some of the financial considerations. We do still have some occasional patients that just cannot afford these new drug therapies. We're getting some help from not-for-profit organizations in that regard, but I still would like to really have that option be available for everybody, regardless of insurance and what insurance they have. And I do think that's improving. We've seen the last you know, three to six months some improvement in that, but it's still a real challenge. And, you know, Jamie is working on a lot of this stuff and is dedicated, honestly, most of her time to the REMS program with Mavic Hampton and just helping some of these people navigate the complexities of that and the finances of it. Yeah, the finances of healthcare in HCM is, is really an important factor to us as we go into 2024. And I, I have a project or two that I want to work on in health economics for HCM. We typically look at health economics as an individual issue and you look at the patient and you say, how much does it cost to treat this patient? We're a little different because it's not just the patient, it's the family. Sometimes just getting through annual screening for children can push people through their high deductible plans and cause financial devastation for families with an extra six or ten thousand dollars of expenses every single year because it's the health plan that they have access to. I think we need to be realistic. Throwing big dreams out. You're ready for big dreams. What if insurance companies understood that screening was much more cost effective than delayed a diagnosis and would pay? for screenings in families with congenital defects, with genetic markers, with genetic history, and make sure that they're getting those timely diagnoses without going broke. I spoke to a family this week, adult child of a physician has a high deductible plan. How do I get them diagnosed without breaking the bank? Because they have a high deductible plan. These aren't choices we should have to make. Eat or get diagnosed. Yeah. We have to make it easier for people to get access to care. Absolutely. It like breaks your heart when you have patients clinic and they say, you know, well, I can't take that because I can't afford that. We do everything we can to get patients what they need in a reasonable way, you know, but like that shouldn't be an obstacle. Like you just said, eat or take this drug, you know, and unfortunately it is still like that. I have two or three people right now reaching out to me that have been, um, had their Mavic Hampton funded through a foundation who the money from the foundation is about to run out and they're in a state of panic. Do I have to go back to not feeling well at all because I really am benefiting from this medication, but now I'm not going to be able to afford it? Well, I can assure you that I am working directly with the manufacturer the, with Bristol Myers Squibb to ensure that all pathways are maintained open. And if anybody's having difficulty accessing, we want to know so that we can advocate on their behalf. I've reached out to a number of insurance carriers who were slow to put Camzios on formulary and we were having those conversations and explaining the value and the benefit to the patient. We've gotten almost all of them turned around. Medicare is still gonna be a little difficult for some people because of the co-pays and deductibles that won't change until 2025 but we're in the final stretch. We're, we're on the way to 2025 and hopefully it'll be easier for them. These new drugs are expensive. And as a patient advocate, I find myself in this, how do you pay for discovery and clinical trials and the development of meds, get them to patients at a reasonable cost and want to stay in the field to make new meds? There's lots of complicated answers here. And nobody's the bad guy. Nobody's the good guy. We all just have to figure out how we're going to evolve together. The FDA is involved with this, the concept of the IRA and how they are changing drug costs and how industry can make money. We need to find a balance between profitable companies and patients who can get access. It's complicated. Anybody have a great idea for that one? No, I completely agree. You know, there's research and development. You know, we get the idea that pharmaceutical companies need to be in this to help people and make a profit. And, and it's, yeah, it's a complicated uh, arena. So I actually need to get back to the hospital, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for joining us for a few minutes. We weren't sure that you were going to pop in, but we're glad that you did. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. we'll have a full conversation on Tales yeah. from the Heart and we'll have you come back and join us. Yeah, thanks for the advocacy on Capitol Hill and we wish you well in doing that. We really appreciate it. Back to the PA and the, and the nurse. So Annie, let's give it for a minute. 
as I said earlier, not many programs have PAs. Yeah. What is a PA and how is it different than other providers? Oh my gosh. Well, so I, like I said, I've been a PA for 21 years now and I absolutely love my job from the very beginning. Like I, I remember being an x-ray tech and seeing there was three cardiology PAs. This was, you know, 1987. Oh my God. And I remember seeing them when I was a, an x-ray tech and I, I was like, Ooh, I don't know what they are, but I want to be like them. I want to do that. You know, first and foremost, it is the PA profession has grown immensely and there are so many more PA programs in the United States. It's ridiculous, which is so good because there's so many young, enthusiastic, eager people to treat. Being a PA, I really feel like I am that, it's a team, it's a part of being a team. And that's what I like about being a physician assistant is I like to be the person on the team that is the one that keeps the glue and keeps us all together and on the same page and, you know, and organizing and collecting and making the patients feel and to know and to understand that we know exactly what we are talking about. And even though you may have gone through three other people and I've not had a good experience, you come to a program that's a center of excellence and you have that expertise. And I think that's really important. As far as the PA profession, I love what I do every day. So Dr. Zenker and I, we have a really good relationship. We round on our patients in the hospital every morning together. So if you are HCM patient in clinic, we see you when you're admitted to our hospital. We round every morning together on all of our patients. And we actually, you know, I wanted to tell you this on a side note, is that we have transplanted two HCM patients this year already, actually. One is getting ready to go home and the other one went home two weeks ago. We so have to remind them that we have the transplant pathway discussion group where they can yes. join their fellow HCMers who are on the other side as they recover. Yes, exactly. And, you know, it's funny, we were saying about the, the patients that get transplanted, our HCM patients were like, oh, we get so sad because we don't get to see them again. You know, they're like on this other course now. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. But going back to the PA profession, I really, I love being that person. I love having the responsibility to be a part of this amazing team and to continue to learn, to continue to educate our patients so they can educate other people. And I think that that's really like my biggest passion is to teach about HCM because I think it, it's so important. And, you know, I tell my colleagues, it's not rocket science. You know, it's, it's really like if you take the time, like you can understand it, you know. So it's a matter of I think people get overwhelmed with the word. They can't even pronounce it. So we try to abbreviate it. But I think the more that we do as PAs, as mid-levels, to educate our colleagues and just the community in general is what I have a passion for doing. Thanks for that perspective. Jamie, you, you shared with us earlier, you started your career at UCLA and you were in cardiac care there. Your career went into different directions in nursing and now you're back in cardiology, but you're in HCM. What's different about working as a nurse in an HCM program than maybe some other modalities. How How is your day different as an HCM nurse? That might make me emotional, actually. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the connection with the patients that we see, I love our patients. And the fact that I'm, I'm privileged to be a part in this journey for them, educating them, making sure that, that their care is the pathway of their care is going as we need it to go to properly diagnose and treat them and to be that support person. When I call them on the phone from my office, I don't even need to introduce who it is calling. They know we have a relationship. And I think that's really important. There's trust. They know if, if Jamie said she's going to get back to me on such and such issue, they know that I'm going to get back to them. And so they have complete trust in us and we are completely dedicated to making sure that, that things are going their way. It's, it's gratifying in a whole different way. You know, I've been, I've been at the bedside with the emergencies. I've been in so many different avenues of patient care. And for me, this kind of takes every little piece of nursing that I've done over the over the years and put it together into one role. So I think our community is pretty amazing too. I've been working with different families for 
28 years this month. Extraordinary to watch the relationships grow. And I have like little kids that were diagnosed like in the 90s who grown up, had families, have their, now their kids are dealing with HM2. So we're dealing with the generational, but like I brought them up from like eight, nine years old to adults 28 years later. <laughs> and like they, their names are part of my life and their stories are part of who I am too. And we've all kind of grown together in our knowledge and understanding. We've grieved losses together. We've gotten angry together. We've laughed at the absurdity of life together, <laughs> but there is something about a group of people who live with the knowledge that their heart isn't normal. And at the moment there's no cure but they're living their best lives and we're helping them do that. It's kind of, it is kind of different than other forms of healthcare, disease advocacy. I just think we're a super cool community. I do too. <laughs> For sure. I, you know, Annie, you mentioned earlier, one of your mentors and still a good friend to all of us. And that's Dan Jacoby. Yes. Who I tease our friends over at Cytokinetic, a sponsor. <laughs> acknowledge that they stole two center of excellence directors and i told them no more you only get two so <laughs> Wagner from oshu went over to industry and dan went over to industry and they are working so hard on this other way of of serving the community we don't get to see them in clinical practice all the time anymore but they're working on these big concepts that are going to change hcm care forever and I just want to acknowledge that they, they were once just little cardi cardiologists and uh, now they're changing our world for, for the better. And it's kind of amazing to watch things develop like this. Okay, we did not practice this. Best HCM story of the last 12 months de-identified by name. What was your, yeah, we got, we nailed that one. I would say probably this guy that just got transplanted is a good story. So it was a guy that diagnosed with HCM a long time ago by another facility, struggling with symptoms for many, many years, many, many years, and came to our program. And we got a cardiopulmonary stress test on him, and he is going home from his transplant. So that's the very short story that I'm telling you. However, for this patient, unfortunately, it was a long, awful course, long, many years. And now he's like, I can't believe one visit we get this test. Why wasn't this done before? So I think it's very important. I think a couple of things, especially with the myosin inhibitors now, is that as an HCM community, we cannot forget about, number one, ischemic heart disease, because we have a lot of HCM patients that got lazy, that got morbidly obese, that got diabetes, okay. that got ischemia. So let's explain to people who don't know what the word ischemia means. What is ischemia? Ischemia means that there's an area that's not getting enough blood supply, basically, insufficient blood supply, whether ischemia to the brain causing a stroke, ischemia to the heart causing a heart attack. We can't forget about all of the other risk factors and all of the other diseases that our HCM patients have. So with that being said, we're very conscious of making sure that we take the time to look at every single test, not just get a stress echo, but if they're having symptoms, maybe they need a stress MRI or, you know, we need to just not forget about ischemia. And for that patient in particular, he did have ischemia in the beginning, but he also had HCM when he was first diagnosed. So he had this very long course where they just kept cathing and cathing and cathing him when really his prognosis was getting worse and worse. And by the time we met him, his quality of life was awful. And immediately the cardiopulmonary stress test identified that he was really sick and then ended up getting transplanted. So it's really important, I guess, if you're struggling with symptoms and you've been diagnosed by a doctor and you're still struggling is to keep working on it and to keep seeing people and get to a center of excellence or, or just make sure that that person that's taking care of you is knowledgeable about all of the options. Because before we didn't have these options, right? We only had a couple of things. We had some Band-Aids with the medications. and But now we have a lot, we have a lot of options. It's very important to discuss all of the options with the patients because like Dr. Zaker said, what's good for one person may not be good for another person. But along that realm, we need to not forget about the other things like ischemia, like coronary disease. I think that's a great success story. and. 
I think some people will listen to it and go, transplant's not success. Yes, it is. Sure. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. It's not the path that most of us will go. 5%-ish right. will go to transplant or should be worked up for a transplant. And when you get there in time, we do really well. If you get there too late, the rest of the body starts to break down. So timing is everything. I'm going to go to Jamie because I know she's working in the myosin clinic a lot. What have you seen in the myosin clinic? The stories that I have collected in one year's time of how the use of Mavic Hampton has changed lives is unbelievable and and I even have goosebumps right now and I tell every patient when I'm doing the education on the on the whole program and the REMS program and the and the follow up and and their commitment every single time I get goosebumps because it's unbelievably exciting for me to be part of something that's changing so many lives and you know thinking to one gentleman that I met early on when I first started working here. He was kind of a mopey guy. Like he would come in, like you could tell he didn't feel good, didn't smile, didn't really even talk much. And month one, still the same way. Month two, kind of still the same way. He comes in on the third month, standing tall, big smile on his face, cracking jokes. And I was like, that's that's what it's about. This guy feels good and he still feels good. And it's so exciting, completely changed his life. And he's a father. He's more present for his kids, for his wife. It's a whole, a whole change in his life. That is amazing. I love these stories. You never hear enough of them. While we have some viewers here watching us, if anybody has any questions, they can drop it in the feed. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Annie or Jamie, I'd be more than happy to push those off to them. But as we talk about the success stories, I told you our New Jersey Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act success story in diagnosis and management. That's my favorite of the year so far. But there are so many happy stories, so many happy ending stories, and we want more and more happy ending stories. We don't always get them. We don't. And we can't overlook the grief that many of these families have felt through generations. And as kind of one of the messages that I'm trying to get out this heart month is about knowing your family heart health history. So I'm going to tell you a little story while we wait for some questions, because it proves that God has a weird sense of humor or the universe or whoever you want to claim does. So I started to think about where did my HCM start? And of course, I think of my grandfather who had a cardiac arrest in 1953 and died at 43, but it goes beyond that. Oh, wait, his grandmother. Margaret Hart, H-A-R-T, was her maiden name. And I'm like, but her brother also died from H. Simpson. So where does it go beyond that? The good news is I have a brother-in-law who's a historian and a genealogist. And my brother-in-law had the answer for me because I'm like, who was Margaret's father? And he said, Mr. Hart. I'm like, no, no, no. Where did he come from? So here's what I know, that John W. Hart, born in 1840 and died in 1887. That's not very old. Mm. He married Johanna Dobbins. She lived 1848 to 1919. She lived a bit longer. And John Hart was Margaret Teresa Hart's father. And she lived 1876 to 1926. So this is where I believe my HCM comes from. So if you're in Cavan County, Ireland, and you have relatives with the last name of Flanagan or Hart, we're going to want to take a look at your family history and uh, call me. We might be cousins. This is where it comes back to and we go forward. There's been a lot of early deaths. There's been strokes. There's been heart failure. There's been cardiac arrest in my family. But in this generation and today, I have family members with implantable defibrillators. I have one on a myosin inhibitor. I have one who doesn't take any drug therapy at all, one who takes a beta blocker and a transplant and another ICD and a cousin and medical management and a cousin. And this is what we do. We just protect the ones that are coming next and the ones that are here. Gene therapy may be an answer for some. Myosin inhibitors may be an answer for some. But damn, it's a good day to have a bad Mm -hmm. disease. Mm-hmm. So know your family heart health. Do you guys know your family heart health histories? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Just check it. Just check it. Because we do have clinicians working within the HCM space that are also members of the tribe. One in 250 people could have HCM. 
and they could be a PA or a doctor or a nurse or an advocate. We're everywhere. I have a funny story about my last student. This is kind of funny. So she went back. So she, her elective, PA elective is six weeks. So she did six weeks with us. And then at the end of the six weeks, they have to go back and give a presentation, an oral presentation on something that they learned in their six week rotation. So she did it on HCM and she had one of her friends videotape it for me because I couldn't, I had clinic that day. So they recorded it and she did such an amazing job. But I'll tell you, part of it was that... <laughs> She said, because I had drilled it in her head about anxiety, asthma, get an EKG, get an echo. So part of her talk was that, you know, so my preceptor tells me about anxiety and asthma and, you know, get an EKG and get an echo. And she's like, well, so for six weeks, you know, I have anxiety and I do have asthma. So for six weeks, I thought I had HCM. <laughs> she doesn't have HCM. Okay. <laughs> but the entire, the entire rotation, she thought she had HCM because I kept saying that to her. The point was, is that I really, you know, obviously I love doing what I'm doing. I am so fortunate and so grateful for Yale and the mentorship and the education about research because that was my first time that I was ever involved in any kind of research. And I was able to bring that here to St. Thomas. And we have this amazing research team here. We're involved in everything. We have Jamie. Our program is growing and growing. It's really, it's really so amazing. And it's so gratifying, like Jamie said, to see these patients and they're all like, it's just so gratifying. And it's so, it feels like so cool to be in the HCM world right now because there's so much going on. That along though, it brings a lot of responsibility to the people that like us, Center of Excellence, our responsibility to continue to educate others to diagnose so we can help prevent the bad things. I've seen some changes in the past couple of weeks months on who's coming to us as newly diagnosed and there are people who've been suffering out there for years again and they were kind of lost in system but all the hcm education through hcm academy and through a lot of the third party that we're working with medical education through prime and peerview and all these other companies that are coming to us to help do medical education the new thing i'm seeing curious if you're seeing this yet or not women with smaller builds, thinner wall measurements, but still not normal and obstruction. I think we're getting better at echo in the community. We're seeing something happen. Yes, yes, yes. We have been seeing people actually, yeah, they're not really thick, but they're obstructed, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's HCM too. You don't have to have enormously thick hearts. It could be subtle. And I think we were missing them before and I think we're finally seeing them. Right. And if there's even any kind of the concern on the echo and they're having symptoms, then that's your indication to get the MRI because that's what's going to, you know, help you figure it all out, basically. Yeah. So we have a question from the private group. So we don't have a name. Son just relocated to Nashville. HCM diagnosed in 22. Best route to establish care with you at St. Thomas. I'll let you do an ad. How do they get in contact with you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the HCM coordinator and... What do I put my phone number out there? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, can, we can let this go to the HCM directory and Ross will drop a link below to where they can find your, your contact information in the directory. So that makes it a little easier, but they can call, they can check their insurance coverage with you. They can set up an appointment. And get yes, I'm, I'm happy to talk with them and get them set up and we'll find out, you know, what they've had done thus far, what we need to do moving forward and, and get them in to see Dr. Zanker. And there's the link. So we have a comment here. Let's read this together. Kim Zios has helped me feel great as much as I love it. It's so difficult to plan your life. There will be times where echo required longer than three months, not complaining. Well, maybe a bit, very grateful. Okay. The REMS program is there for a reason. And I know it's a pain in the neck administratively for a center, for the patient, but I wanna set expectations here and let you understand the why and then the what might come. The original clinical trial was less than 400 patients. I think it was less than 300 patients. So the data was really encouraging, but it was such a small sample study that there's the potential for other effects that we didn't know. And then there was also this concern about the drop in ejection fraction that did happen in a very small number of people. So out of an abundance of safety, the FDA put this REMS program on the label to get it out to you faster without having to do a big, big trial, which would have taken a long, long time and we'd still be in trials today, but we have to do this surveillance. It's a pain, 
but it's safe and it's going to keep you safe and it's going to keep everybody safe. And at some point when we learn more about the drug and which anatomies it works better in than others or which profiles work better than others, maybe the REMS will, will pair back a little bit. But for right now and probably for at least the next year, it's going to stay where it is. Sorry about the inconvenience, but it's probably going to end sometime. Annie, Jamie, would you agree? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, when we educate our patients about myosin inhibitors, we, we educate them on the commitment, not only their commitment, but our commitment to making sure that things are getting done properly and on time. We educate them to make sure that they understand the reason why we need to get the echoes at a certain time. It's not just because, it's just because of something very, very important, right? I think that that is the conversation. I think, you know, when we have these shared decision-making conversations with our patients, you have to identify the people that are able and willing and can understand and comprehend the commitment with taking a myosin inhibitor and getting your echoes on time so we're keeping you safe. And, you know, there are some people that just, they can't comprehend it or they don't want to participate or they think, oh yeah, that she's just saying that today, but you know, in a few months, maybe I won't have to come back. I think it's very important for people to understand that a myosin inhibitor amazing. It's like a blessing to the HCM community. We're learning so much more about this and it's so amazing. And the last thing you want to do is not follow some sort of guideline that's going to harm our patients. For all the patients on myosin inhibitors, the echoes are done for a certain reason. They are done at a certain time from all of the data that we've already collected from all of the prior study. Will it change eventually? Probably, maybe if I had to guess, but at this point in time, we need to stay safe. We need to make sure we understand. And the only way to understand is to keep keep researching and keep collecting more information from the people that are on the mice inhibitors. I think that's a great roundup. How are you discussing the future with Affy Campton? So Affy's still in trial. There may come a time where we have a label indication for Affy Campton and obstructed as well. And then it's going to come down to a conversation with your provider as to which one might be right for you. I remind you, there are many different beta blockers. There are many different calcium channel blockers. They vary slightly and some are the right match chemically for you and some of them are not. And that I think we're gonna see play out with myosin inhibitors because their properties are just a little bit different. So we, th this is in the same class. Navicamptin or Campsios is first in class. Afficampton is second in class. And then there's even a company called Edgewise, another sponsor, working on a different version of a myosin inhibitor. The concept that we can get to a myosin inhibitor and that we're working on a, a different layer within the cardiac structure itself. We never had a drug that could touch this before. Right. And it probably is going to have use in other communities outside of HCM. They're looking at this in HEFPAF, so that's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. There's studies starting there. So there, we're at the beginning of a new way of treating heart disease, and it's amazing. But it's going to be a slow roll, and it's going to be expensive until it's not. And then it'll be available to everybody through hopefully authorized generics of high quality in 10 years. We got a long way to go. Yeah. Okay. So a question that I think we're going to wrap up with today, because we've got a PA and a nurse who are in the field. Claire is a nurse and an HCM patient. And just curious, what career could I pursue in the HCM field? As a nurse? She's a, yes. she's, well, see, here we go. This is Jamie, <laughs> my best friend and left-hand man. <laughs> so, you know, especially with the addition of myosin inhibitors to the HCM community, first of all, our volume, you know, you diagnose one person and then the entire family. I will say right now, before Jamie joined us, it was a lot. It was me and Dr. Zenker, you know, and then we got a genetics team. So they take care of all of that. So I don't have to take care of that anymore, you know, and now I have Jamie helping with all of the Kamsayo. So for a nurse, HCM programs, I think I would say it's ideal for an HCM program to have obviously attending a mid-level nurse. That is like a good team because you need those three people just for the core I'm talking besides all, you know, the surgeons, EP and all that. But as a nurse, there is a lot of opportunity to help the HCM community. And it's only going to grow and grow because hopefully this HCM awareness is going to help people diagnose our patients earlier, get them to a center of excellence 
and educate other people to take care of them properly and keep them safe. So for a nurse, whoo, yeah. Just yeah. look around for a center of excellence and- I'm Call sure me, I got friends who need people. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a lot to be done there. Okay, ladies. Send my thanks to Dr. Zanker for popping in. That was adorable. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for Tales from the Heart, which include, in no particular order, Cytokinetics, Bristol Myers Squibb, Edgewise Therapeutics, Embrya Therapeutics, Tanaya Therapeutics, Biomarin. I think we're bringing on Viz AI soon as well. And Lexicon, I think, is coming. We have a lot of new companies in our space. And I, I, I have to end with a little announcement and I'm not used to doing this, but in a couple of days on February 8th, yours truly is getting an award at the BioNJ annual meeting. And I, I'm being given a Heart Hero Award for our work at the HCMA in advocacy and my work personally. Nice. So I, I get a fancy award and the governor's going to be there. So we're going to have a little talk. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. It's a nice way to celebrate my heart anniversary with thinking about, you know, we've done kind of a few things here in the past 28 years. We've come a long way, mm-hmm. but we've got a long way to go. And I'm really happy to have people like you on our team, caring for our families and being part of an amazing community. So thank you both. Well, thank you. You know, and Lisa, thank you so much. Like, I mean, seriously, like, look what you have grown, honestly. You know, this whole HCMA, it is so amazing for patients. Like, kudos to you, you know, for everything that you've done for the HCM community and the patients and your passion. And it's really admirable. Thank you. But in retrospect, I should have waited another two months to do the site visit at Yale. <laughs> Uh, I, I, my workaholic shown its face that day and I'm like, I can come up. Oh my God. What was I, th- I got to go back and look at the calendar and figure out exactly. I don't even, I don't think it was more than nine weeks. It was not that far out. <laughs> no. And I think I like got home and I'm like, okay, what am I doing? Where am I going? <laughs> Seven years. It's been a long ride. It's been a fun ride, but I want to go a lot further. Yeah. I want to take a moment as we leave to to think about two people. The first is Claude Brady. Claude Brady called my office. Oh my goodness. First office, probably around 2002 or three. And so many people had called me and said, I'm the first, I'm the biggest heart. I'm the, this, I'm the, that. But I'm like, if your name ain't Claude Brady, you ain't the first. Cause I knew he was the first patient. So he called and said, I'm, I'm the first patient. I'm like, uh, what's the name? Claude Brady. Yes, it is the first patient. So Claude was diagnosed with HCM in September of 1959. And he was in his 20s. And his brother and his sister were also diagnosed. And uh, he went on in 1988 to get a heart transplant at Hopkins. And he passed away in January of 22 at the age of 84. I want to be like Claude and then some. Yeah. And I encourage all my other transplant pathway friends to be like Claude. I think Claude and I had a very shared view of life post-transplant. We're not patients anymore of HCM, but we are part of a community and we understand things in a way that you couldn't understand before you transplant. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about Claude today, and of course, again, without my donor, Brandy, I wouldn't be here. So days like this are a little emotional, a little... There's a little survivor guilt. There's a little gratitude. There's a little, holy shit, I'm still alive. You know, it's a little bit of everything on a day like today. So thank you for sharing this special day with me. Thanks again to our sponsors and stay tuned for further editions of Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the HCMA. 